Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. This is the December 2021 episode of the podcast, and today we are interviewing Dr. Anthony Hackett. He happens to be one of the three authors of this month's emergency medicine practice issue on thoracic aortic syndromes, one of the scariest things we can encounter in the emergency department, and unfortunately something I had the experience of treating in a series of cases that I'll tell you all about in my conversation with Dr. Hackett. But before we get started, I want to let you know that this month, EB Medicine is offering a $50 Amazon gift card for our new subscribers, and you can get that offer at ebmedicine.net. And I also wanted to let you know that we've been doing some work behind the scenes. If you haven't been to the website recently, I encourage you to go and click on the blog button. It's been fully redesigned. There's new content on there. It's all free and open access to anyone on the internet. And it includes everything from clinical pathways to practice pearls to risk management information. It is a very valuable resource and it's yours free. All for going to ebmedicine.net and clicking on the blog. And that's it for the announcements. Now let's get on to our interview with Dr. Hackett. I'm Anthony Hackett. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Texas A&M University. I work at Bryan College Station Hospital mainly, which is our Texas A&M campus here in Texas. I was a prior military physician in the past, and that's how I ended up in Texas. Fantastic. And thank you for joining us on the podcast today. You are one of three authors for the December issue of Emergency Medicine Practice, Thoracic Aortic Syndromes in the Emergency Department. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. As we go through today's podcast, I'll explain to you a series of patients I had within a year, all with a variety of aortic dissections. But tell me before we start, why you picked this topic? I think this topic is really interesting. It's quite nuanced. It's quite rare. And it's something we always talk about and we always worry about. And so that's why the three of us actually had gotten together and and thought this is something we'd really like to learn a lot more about. And here in Texas, actually, when you have aortic dissections, there's actually a lot of really great centers for them. But truth be told, there are so many specialists, like there's a guy that operates on the root of the dissection, there's a guy that does the valve, and that sort of thing. So as we started having more and more of these cases, I realized that I thought, wow, this is quite complex. And I think for emergency physicians, time matters. And so finding out where to send these people, how to diagnose them, what can you do if you're out in a rural center? What can you do if you're at a big center? That's what we really wanted to touch on. We really wanted to be able to address all of those sort of things. Yes, I don't think anything makes me quite as anxious in the emergency department as a patient with an aortic dissection or an aneurysm or something rupturing. Their propensity to decline very quickly is really nerve-wracking, and I just can't wait to say, hey, please take this person to the OR, help me with this case. So I'm really happy to read this issue. It's fantastic. It's filled with a ton of information. Let's jump into just some of the basics so we're all talking about the same thing. Let's discuss some of the pathophysiology for the acute aortic syndromes. Now, that's a term that I wasn't accustomed to using prior to reading your issue. So tell me, what does acute aortic syndrome actually encompass? Sure, yeah, great question. So actually, this is another reason why we did this paper because it, it is quite complex. So acute aortic syndromes does not actually include aortic aneurysms proper. So acute aortic syndromes includes three different subtypes of things. So that's your the feared aortic dissection, and also two lesser known, but just as dangerous entities, uh, the intramural hematoma and the penetrating aortic ulcer. So most common things being common, the dissection is makes up most of these pathologies, but they all have a similar root. So let's dive into that then. The pathophysiology for all three of these things begins with some kind of insult or injury to that intimal layer, that inner layer of the aorta. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Actually, for the penetrating aortic ulcers in the aortic dissection, it's actually a pretty similar pathology. As we know, like we've all learned in the medical school residency, the the the, there are three layers of the aorta itself, right? Intima media and adventitia. And the unique thing about the aorta is that it has a vascular layer on the outside as well, the vasovisorium. So those are important to keep in mind how this thing works. So basically what you what happens is you have to have some sort of predisposing defect in your aorta, whether that be an intrinsic collagen defect or severe hypertension, 
A lot of us have seen this with drug use, like sympathomimetics, that sort of thing. So what happens is you increase the pressure, and this is for dissection specifically, generally increase the pressure in the lumen of the aorta, and that inside layer, the intima, which is very delicate, starts tearing. And once that tears, blood gets inside the media, and the media is just some fibroelastic tissue that allows the uh, aorta to expand and contract with the heartbeat. Once blood gets in there, that pressure will then dissect through that media and then separate out the flap. And what you get is a flap of intima and then this dissecting media piece. And you can imagine with all the sort of arteries connected to the aorta and the tributaries that you can tear off one of those tributaries. That's how you get all the weird person with chest pain and, as we say, so chest pain and limb ischemia, chest pain and renal ischemia, chest pain and syncope. So that's how those things happen. So that's what happens with the dissection. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And then the intramural hematoma, the origin or the pathophysiology for developing one of those is different than the typical yeah. dissection or an ulcer? Yeah, it is. It's interesting. So intramural hematomas and penetrating aortic ulcers happen in patients who are a little bit older than patients who would normally get any aortic dissection, although the risk factors are similar. And those risk factors are hypertension, smoking, prior atherosclerotic disease. So the intramural hematoma, like the vasovasorium that we were talking about earlier, what happens there is that you get micro atherosclerosis in the vasovisorium, and then that then bleeds into the media, but from the outside in. Whereas the penetrating aortic ulcer, what happens is you get a cholesterol plaque, and then that scent sort of penetrates through the intima into the media, but because it's hardened, unlike the dissection, it doesn't cause an immediate localized dissection. It just creates this crater. And then as the aorta sort of experiences forces over time, that crater can enlarge. Both the intramural hematoma and the penetrating aortic ulcer can and sometimes do turn into dissections, but that usually takes time. So it's something that we probably find incidentally on a CAT scan and say, what's this? What do we do about this? But because they have a pretty high risk, and some would say for the high numbers, 30, 40% uh, percent of those are going to turn into a aortic dissection at some point. And additionally, most of those penetrating aortic ulcers and intramural hematomas can be associated with aneurysmal dilation of the aorta because the risk factors are the same. And when you combine those things like aneurysmal dilation of the aorta with penetrating aortic ulcer or intramural hematoma, that changes the dynamics of the wall of the aorta. And then what happens is it sets you up for even more risk of dissection. Okay. Now, between the three of those things, we are constantly looking for aortic disease or paranoid about patients presenting with the chest pain and, but what is epidemiologically the actual rate of presentation? Do we have any idea how common aortic dissection or one of these acute aortic syndromes is? Yeah, I would say it's probably like one of the most talked about rare diseases, right? That's a, a feared rare disease. And so the rate, depending on what you read, is somewhere between six to 10,000 cases per year, essentially, which isn't that much. Depending on where you work, it can be more. So it's pretty rare. So most of those cases are actually aortic dissection cases. And then on the order of, say, somewhere around 10% is penetrating aortic ulcers, um, and about 10 to 15% is intramural hematomas. So somewhere around 80% of those cases will be aortic dissection. And then when we're talking about mortality, which is the reason we're also anxious about these cases, there's a very high mortality associated with these injuries to the aorta. How severe is it? Yeah, so about probably about 40% of these patients will die prior to initial presentation. So this would be an autopsy finding. Of those patients that make it to the hospital, the mortality is about 1% to 2% per hour of mistreatment. And approaches, we're talking, depending on what data you read, there's a lot of data from the Japanese. Actually, Japanese data make, made up a lot of aortic dissection studies. And what they found was that these patients, if it's, a, if it's an ascending dissection, most of those patients don't really survive without operative intervention. However, descending dissections, and we can get into the reasons why later, descending di dissections tend to do better over time, but they will eventually progress to either morbidity or mortality. But the real thing we're really scared about is an ascending aortic dissection for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and so interesting that the mortality rate here is calculated by hour as opposed to most other things we think about, the mortality is on an annualized basis or per year. Or in some cases, when things are really bad, we think of, oh, what's your 30-day mortality? But in this case, right. it's by hour, which I think exactly. is the only entity I've ever seen with a mortality rate measured in that time interval. So 1% to 2% an hour means that within three days, everybody's dead. 
Exactly. And in most of these patients, if you look at the 30 day mortality, it's 90 something percent. And that includes your t- all comers type A and type B symptomatic dissections, right? Because you can have chronic dissections. That's a whole other thing too. But I agree, very deadly disease. And that's considering that 40% of those patients may have died before a presentation. So you're talking about the ones that actually survived. Now, when we focus on acute aortic dissections, there are still classically two classifications in two classification systems. I thought for a while there we were shifting away from using DeBakey and more focused on the Stanford system, but they still are both commonly used by our surgical colleagues. So let's talk about the differences between those two classification systems. Yeah. So DeBakey, I think the reason people stepped away from DeBakey is because it did cause a little bit of murkiness, essentially, because you can have some mixture in the the type 2 versus type 3. So most folks are using Stanford A or Stanford B dissections. And I think in our paper, we generally introduced those terms and then essentially talked about things mostly unified under Stanford A and B. So Stanford A would be any ascending dissection that essentially dissects, when you say ascending dissection, we mean it dissects up to the takeoff of the left subclavian. So that would include your major branch vessels, carotid, et cetera, and from the aortic root all the way up there. And then a descending dissection occurs from the takeoff of the left subclavian all the way down past the diaphragm. And when we talk about thoracic dissection, we mean above the diaphragm. But of course, you can find these dissections anywhere along the aorta itself in the abdomen or in the thorax. Yeah. So the type B then involves anywhere along that descending above or below the... Exactly. In the DeBakey, I think the DeBakey is useful for more for surgical planning and probably for anatomic classifications for surgeons. But for our intents and all intents and purposes for us, basically the A versus B is the most useful because it divides where our surgical management is most important where medical management or endovascular repair may be more useful. Good. Now, you mentioned some of the risk factors already, but let's spend a little bit more time discussing those. The most common risk factors you mentioned were? So most common risk factors in all comers would be hypertension, smoking. Hypertension is probably the number one risk factor, especially, and then age. You combine those things, age, smoking, hypertension, anything that would give you atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is going to predispose you to having an aortic dissection. But if you're living long-term with hypertension, that's a major one. If you're younger, people, usually these things, as I explained earlier, occur in patients over 70 or around 70 um, is the most common age. But when you have a patient with a younger uh, age and aortic dissection, let's say you're in your 40s, usually that's a patient who has pre-existing either genetic or collagen vascular disease or patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease or somebody who had prior aortic surgery, a trauma, that's very rare. But in general, the most common risk factors for younger folks would be collagen vascular disease, Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, not all types of Ehlers-Danlos, but the vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and specifically the Marfanoid folks because they have that fibrillin mutation, which then disturbs the media. And so they are predisposed to having destruction of that media and then the expansion of the aorta. Pregnancy is another risk factor in young patients because the aorta becomes essentially more elastic and you have some swings in blood pressure that can occur. And so we can see aortic dissection in pregnancy as well. And so those are risk factors for young patients. But for the older folks, it's hypertension, smoking, and coronary artery disease, essentially. Yeah, I cannot imagine anything more horrific than a pregnant patient with an aortic yeah. dissection. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. If it wasn't bad enough, we'll just <laughs> throw in the pregnancy while we're at right. it. Right. <laughs> That's just terrifying. I did find it very interesting. You mentioned in the article that nearly every patient with Marfan syndrome will have evidence of aortic disease at some point in their lifetime. That's correct. So really highly associated with Marfan syndrome. Yeah. And I think for those of us who have um, seen these patients before, you may see these patients again and again, because it it is all the way throughout the aorta. You can have dissections all the way down into the iliacs. You can have localized arterial dissections, any muscular artery, but specifically the aorta that most Marfanoid folks will have aortic disease at some point. Terrifying. Yeah. All right. So Now that we understand a little bit of the background and the classification, let's talk about some of the care. We start always in the pre-hospital setting when we're talking to our EMS colleagues or if they're listening and are curious, what's a typical aortic dissection going to look like in the field and what is it that they can do to help with some of that high mortality? What are we recommending? What what can they do? Yeah. And I think the caveat being that these things are classically easier to recognize in a textbook than in the field. So I think that's a hard job. They have a hard job. These things can look like a variety of different things. But I think 
the big things that might stand out to paramedics or folks working in the field is patients with severe chest pain, acute onset chest pain, severe range hypertension, but 200 and above, sympathomimetic drug use, those are all risk factors. And so if you see somebody with Severe chest pain, severe range hypertension, who just used a bunch of cocaine, seems very agitated. That's something you should consider in your differential diagnosis. And actually, one study that you may have seen in the paper, they looked at people who were thought to have findings consistent with aortic dissection or symptoms of that. So severe chest pain, severe hypertension. And then in those EMS systems, they said, take them to a hospital that has cardiovascular surgery capabilities. And they found that those patients overall actually had a better mortality or better outcomes because some of those patients included patients who had aortic dissections and they were recognized in the field. So I think it does, I think you're right, it does start in the field and saying, I think this guy might have a dissection. And if you're talking about someone who's an older guy with severe hypertension and severe acute onset chest pain, then controlling that blood pressure is probably something that can help to decrease the progression of that aortic dissection. You know, one of the things we don't often think about is hypotension or low blood pressure, which you also mentioned in the issue. So how often does that occur in somebody with acute aortic dissection? Pretty low, actually. As we talked about with hypertension, about the most common finding is in aortic dissection is actually hypertension. It's about 50% of patients have hypertension, but hypotension is like on the order of, depending what you read, 10%. And when you see hypotension in an aortic dissection, you have to think of a few things. You have to think of either cardiac tamponade, dissection into a, a branch coronary artery, specifically the right mm. coronary artery with some evolving right coronary artery ischemia or a contained rupture. So it's very unusual to have hypotension in the setting of aortic dissection. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, I had a string of aortic dissections in the course of, of one year. One of them was a patient who was a, a healthy woman, a former dancer, was on a treadmill and was in her 60s and all of a sudden just dropped. And after she dropped, she developed chest pain. EMS brought her in uh, with chest pain, had given her aspirin and, uh, and said she was hemodynamically okay. Her pressure was fine in route, but fine was around 100. And by the time right. she made it to the ED, she was hypotensive. And they said she was doing well. As soon as she got the aspirin, really her chest pain went away. And I said, you know, are you hurting? You don't look very comfortable. She said, I have just excruciating back pain and my left leg just feels heavy and numb. And uh, I said, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this not is good very, <laughs> very bad. And she indeed had a type A dissection all the way from the aortic root down the aorta into her left femoral. And, and it was a luckily the thoracic surgeon just complicating matters. This was a like a Monday morning or a Wednesday morning, and the thoracic surgeon was literally in the hallway outside the OR about to scrub into a case to perform a bypass surgery and said, I'm about to go into a five-hour case, so this person needs to go by helicopter somewhere else. And I said, this person is going to die if yeah. you can't come and do something about this literally right now. And he said, what am I supposed to do with this patient on the table? And I said, I said well, if they're intubated and it's an elective bypass, just have them move to the ICU and wait until, yep. or even have them extubated. It's okay. But this person is going to die. And, and thankfully he, he heeded my advice and came over and saw her and she did very, very well. But that was just a terrifying presentation for what turned out to be an acute aortic dissection. And so that's always in the back of my mind now when I'm seeing the hypotensive with severe pain or a neuro deficit or something of that sort. Yeah, that is a scary case, Sam. I, I Yes, and I can echo those as well. And I think, yeah, whenever you see somebody with a weird symptom. And the other thing, too, that you brought up that's subtle and we don't think about is these symptoms that show up and they're very concerning and then they resolve, right? Mm -hmm. So like some sort of neuro deficit, a migratory neuro deficit, those are things that should always make you think, is this an aortic dissection? Because you know that flap is mobile and so it can occlude an artery for some period of time um, or the flap can actually dissect off and go somewhere distally like the femoral artery or a renal artery or something like that. So I think that makes this all the more scary, right? So that's a great transition actually to our next question, which is now they come to the emergency department and we're going to take a history from them. And of course, we're going to ask about past medical history, Right. but what other things should we be asking? Maybe about symptoms that came and went, you know, maybe they forget to tell you, oh, well, I kind of did have neck pain and a headache, but that's all gone now kind of scenario. Right. Yeah. There is actually a score out there, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit of detail later, but 
that takes all of those sort of important physical findings um, and history findings into account. But that's kind of how I structure my, uh, you know, when I'm getting my history from these patients. When did it happen? Was it abrupt and onset? Does it go to your back? So some of the most common things that we are taught and sort of do bear out in clinical practice are the abruptness of the onset. So was it acute onset tearing or ripping pain that goes from the chest to the back? That's a pretty common finding in aortic dissection, specifically type A or aortic dissections. As we mentioned before, migratory deficits. So for example, my left arm was weak and didn't move. And this is an interesting thing. And then my right leg didn't move or something, something that doesn't make sense. Two dots that don't connect, something that crosses the diaphragm, we should always think, right? So can't move my legs, but I have severe chest pain probably, you know, definitely need to consider a dissection, right? Like your case, syncope and chest pain, kind of unusual. I mean, obviously it can happen in a pulmonary embolus, but in this case, yours was syncope with a with a deficit that occurred as well. So um, I, I think that the constellation of aortic dissection can be several different things that are severe, but don't seem to make sense in, temporally, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that actually brings me to to my second case in that series, which was a woman I saw uh, at a freestanding ED who presented saying that she just had some bad Mexican food. <laughs> and when yes. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I was at the restaurant just eating lunch, like literally 15 minutes ago down the street with my husband. And then all of a sudden I got this real bad stomach pain. And then the pain kind of moved. And I said, where'd it go? She said, it kind of went in my chest. And I said, Okay, and how do you feel now? She said, I feel totally fine. I got no yeah. no complaints at all. And I said, so nothing else, just belly to pain. She goes, well, it kind of went up in my chest. And then really, it sounds kind of weird, but I felt something in my neck. And then it went down back into my belly. And then it just felt like it went out my feet. And I said, are you... Are you serious? She goes, yeah, it just <laughs> sounds crazy, doesn't it? And I said, as I'm talking to her, the nurse is placing her on the monitor and taking blood pressures and doing all these things. And I noticed that she's hypotensive. And I said, wait, your blood pressure is like 88 systolic and it's in her left arm. And I just look at the nurse and I say, okay, can you just humor me and take the cuff off and put it on her right arm? And her right arm blood pressure was 120 systolic. And I look at the lady and I say, listen, this is nuts. Either you have something really, really bad or this is nothing. But the only way we're going to figure this out is with a CT scan. And sure enough, she had a type A dissection the wow. entire length of her aorta. And I called the thoracic surgeon and he says, well, what have you given her? And I said, nothing. And he goes, well, how about some like Esmolol? What's her pulse rate? I said, it's 50. And he said, what's her blood pressure? I said, well, her highest systolic is 110 in the good arm and it's 80 in the other arm. And he said, well, how about something for the pain? I said, she's got no pain at all. So the yeah. only thing that was interesting on her exam was that her ankles would hang off the tip of the stretcher. She was a very tall woman, and no one had yeah. ever diagnosed her with any kind of connective tissue disorder. She was just very tall. Uh, and she survived. She did great. She had to get yeah. her aortic root replaced with a new valve and the whole deal. Uh, and I've run into her in a restaurant a couple of times, but just... To, not a Mexican restaurant. Not right? a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> that's right. Just a total crazy case. Uh, that is where, a crazy Where case. she just had no symptoms, but but I had no way to explain. And I said, you know, the only thing that connects all of these places you're talking yeah. about is the giant pipe that goes through your body carrying blood. There's nothing else. And so either this is just a whole bunch of nothing or you've got a terrifying problem. And thankfully, we found it. What a great case. And, and how the history was really key in that case, too, right? So just like we talked about, and I think... That really does hinge on. It happened here. It happened there. And of course, like you said, it could either be nothing or the worst thing in the yeah. world. So so tell me now the risk score you talked about, this aortic dissection detection risk score or the ADDRS, what, yeah. what does it encompass and is it reliable enough for us to use? So this score is actually uh, kind of interesting and I think you're, we're starting to see it, it used a lot more. So the original ADDRS score encompassed some findings and really what it was was 12 either physical exam or historical features and looked at those things and kind of classified who's going to be higher risk for aortic dissection based on the history. And then from there, who do we need to image, right? So that's what it was designed to do. And like I said, there's about 12 and it's really easy to use when you look that up. But um, the ADD RS score originally was designed to risk stratify those who need imaging for aortic dissection. And then later, another group, the advised study, I think it was 2017 or before, they basically came up with uh, the addition of D-dimer to that to make that a little bit more sensitive for aortic dissection. 
Good. So you then it can be used just in your history, or then you can add the right. diagnostic ability of a D-dimer to try and categorize someone who's low risk into someone whom you don't necessarily need to image. Exactly. And so the reason that they came up with this was because, like you said, you can have these nebulous, un initially unconnected deficits or complaints. And so you theoretically could be imaging every person with multiple complaints in the emergency department, right? So that test, that original ADD score was, ADD RS score was designed to eliminate unnecessary imaging, but to decrease the miss rate for aortic dissections as well. And what they found was it was pretty accurate. And actually the um, American College of Cardiology guidelines that came out in 2010 recommend using that score in risk stratification. And the European Society of Cardiology guidelines also recommend using that, that score in risk stratification. The ADD RS plus D dimer score was not, has not been externally validated, but is probably useful in in essentially ruling out aortic dissection. But if I think with any of these scores, if you have any suspicion, even using this score, and you're still suspicious, then you need to get additional imaging and have additional consultation if the patient has risk factors or symptoms that just don't make sense and certainly could indicate that. But they are very helpful. Good. So then really two instances where you can use the score. One is just for the history and the risk stratification, and the second then is in conjunction with the D-dimer, but that's yet right. to be validated. Right. And the guys that, or the group that did the, the ADD RS plus D-dimer study, they, they did a pretty good study. They just haven't externally validated. That study was done, that advised study was done in a multi-center fashion with a pretty large cohort, but in it, it, it's very good at essentially risk stratifying who needs imaging, but you can't really use it to rule out aortic dissection because a person who has an ADD RS of zero with a D-dimer less than 500 basically don't need imaging, but everybody else does. So it's, it's kind of like our, eternal struggle with D-dimer, right? Anytime yeah. the D-dimer is elevated, someone's going to get imaging somewhere. So that, that's where we run into the issue. So you're still getting a lot of scans that you probably don't need, but the rarity and the severity of the disease is so high that missing it is much worse than getting an unnecessary CT scan. Good. So that's the history portion. And then when we move on to exam, anything specific we're looking for on physical exam... I think you brought one thing up, right? Uh, extremity pulse deficit. That's something that I think we're classically taught. It, and I think that a lot of folks, you and I probably both, when we were in medical school, were like every person with an aortic dissection has a pulse deficit. And I think we believe that for a little while, and then you learn, okay, that's not actually true. It's actually fairly rare. Like somewhere around 30% of patients with aortic dissection have a pulse deficit. Like I said, most common finding is always going to be hypertension. About 50% of those patients have hypertension. But the pulse deficit thing occurs in about 30% of patients. Patients can present with stroke as well. About 15% of patients will present with stroke. And then there are some other things too. That case that you had with the syncope, that's actually pretty rare, like I said, around 10% or so. And so those are the most common things. And the most common things are actually things that we write about in textbooks. They're actually fairly rare when you look at the actual physical exam findings. Finding an ischemic limb or something like that is probably on the order of 10% or so, not as high as you would think. And when we and talk about hypertension, so we mentioned this in history, so someone who has a uh -huh. history of like poorly controlled hypertension or even just, right. you know, I'm on medication and it's always great. Right, exactly. History of hypertension or specifically in a patient, a great example would be a patient used a bunch of cocaine and their blood pressure is 220 over something, severe acute onset chest pain, their left leg is cold, or they have a pulse deficit, that sort of thing. And the reason the pulse deficit is kind of rare is because it has to dissect through the left subclavian or it's caused some sort of dissection where the, the right and left arm are essentially isolated, if you will, or they would have to dissect through one of the iliacs, yeah. which, you know, that would have to be an ascending uh, and descending dissection. So a type A and type B dissection essentially could occur. And when we're talking about the risk factors, so just in the historical section, does the, the ADDRS score differentiate between treated or untreated hypertension? Controlled That's or a good question. I think it's a history of uh, just hypertension, in okay. just in general, history of hypertension, and anybody who has connective tissue disease too, by the way, in, in that history as well as included in that ADDRS score. Great. So we've got the exam and the historical features, physical exam, pulse deficits, neuro deficits, and acutely severe hypertension while they're in the department. Now we move on to diagnostics. Where where do we start there? How about uh, labs? We'll start with labs. Anything yeah, so, interesting? Uh, yeah, well, the first thing I think people, a lot of people have hung their hat on is the D-dimer. And that, that is, it's actually addressed in the controversy section of our paper, but your labs 
always getting baseline labs is key, right? So CBC, CMP, PTI, and R, but nothing's really going to tell you too much. An aortic dissection that causes severe anemia, most of those patients won't make it to the hospital. So getting a basic set of labs is important, troponin. And then of course, renal function too, right? Let's say you suspect a aortic dissection and the kidney function uh, is severely impaired. That either means that the dissection is dissected into uh, a renal artery or the patient has pre-existing renal disease. In the past, that had hindered our uh, ability to image these patients, but I think with merging data, and we can discuss this later, that it's actually okay to image those patients. But baseline set of labs, CBC, CMP, PTINR, troponin, BNP, and, and a D-dimer as well in those cases are probably in type and screen as well as what you need. But there's no lab that can really tell us, is this patient having a dissection or not? And I think it's probably a good point to discuss the limitations of D-dimer alone, aortic dissection, because I think some out there in some community practices, there are is sort of a myth that if the D-dimer is negative, then the patient doesn't have a dissection. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not true. Actually, the, the, the kinetics of D-dimer are quite different with dissections than they are with pulmonary emboli for the reasons that sometimes you can have an isolated intramural hematoma or an isolated penetrating uh, aortic ulcer or a very small dissection that's now clotted off and those fibrin split products aren't existing anymore. And so that D-dimer will raise very quickly and then essentially decrease and it, and, it, and it doesn't share the same kinetic. So you can't really rely on a negative D-dimer if you think the patient still has a dissection. And that is one of the reasons why the ADD RS score added the D-dimer because the likelihood that both the D-dimer and a historical feature will be higher or will be present is higher than one of those things alone. Good. And then EKG, anything specific we're looking for on, on that diagnostic test? Sure. Yeah. I think, I think most people would dread the even more complex situation of a STEMI and a dissection, right? Am I missing a dissection, right? That's always the, you know, when you're a second year resident, someone's like, did you took check a chest x-ray and make sure it's not a widened mediastinum? But actually the, ri the rate of STEMI in association with aortic dissection, about 3% of STEMIs are secondary to aortic dissection and mm -hmm. about... 10 to 15 percent of aortic dissections are accompanied by STEMI, if that makes sense. So a very low rate of ST elevation MI is secondary to dissection. The most common finding in EKGs would be some nonspecific T-wave changes, so like T-wave inversions or lateral T-wave changes, basically indicating myocardial ischemia from stress or strain pattern. And those can occur in about 40 percent of cases. Um, but yeah, okay. you shouldn't see a true STEMI in many cases. And that brings us to the next point. You mentioned the chest x-ray. So when we talk about imaging, how good is a chest x-ray really? Not, not as good as, as we have all been led to believe, actually. So the chest x-ray is notoriously inaccurate when you see a finding that's classic for aortic dissection. So that narrowed aortic pulmonary window or the widened mediastinum, those things tend to be somewhat specific for aortic dissection, but at its very best, this chest x-ray is probably 60 to 70% specific for aortic dissection. So, and, and that's one of the reasons why if you look at our algorithm, it says get a chest x-ray, but it doesn't say wide mediastinum or not makes your decision because those things are actually somewhat rare. And depending on the location of the dissection and the extent of the dissection, you may not see any abnormalities on the chest x-ray. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, but anatomically, what actually gives you the widened mediastinum is not the dissection itself. This is going to be some kind of contained rupture right. or it's progressed past the media, out the adventitia and or, or maybe even there's an aneurysm or something that's not a dissection in that kind of scenario. But we're not really looking at the dissection to cause a widened mediastinum because it's just tearing the two layers of the aorta apart. It's not exactly. going to necessarily show up and be exceedingly wide or even abnormal in some cases. So, so that right. negative chest x-ray really shouldn't sway us one way or the other. Yeah, I think only if it's positive, it gives us some clues, right? And also, if you look at your, you know, if, not to base everything on scores, but if you look at that ADDRS score, if there's an alternative diagnosis, then it makes aortic dissection less likely. So if you've got a person with severe acute onset chest pain and they've got a big right lower lobe pneumonia or something like that, then, okay, we think maybe something else is going on here. Um, additionally, pleural effusions are nonspecific, but when you see them in a setting of acute onset chest pain, you should always think maybe this is a dissection with, like you said, contained rupture but basically not as accurate as we are sort of led to believe on the chest x-ray. Okay. And then we mentioned echocardiography, or you mentioned yep. echocardiography in the, in the issue. How helpful is that? So, you know, 
Echo is actually a pretty useful tool now with the rise of bedside POCUS. I think we have to kind of separate it out into two different things, right? There's sort of diagnostic echo and that we would do the, a formal echo, transthoracic or transesophageal echo. So the most accurate thing you can get in the field of, or in the setting of ultrasound diagnosis would be a transesophageal echo because it allows you to visualize most parts of the ascending aorta and part of the descending aorta as well. But obviously that requires the sedation of the patient that requires specialized tools. So we often most, I would, I think it's fair to say that most of us are not able to get a transesophageal echo when needed, right? So doing a transthoracic echo, I think that when we were doing the research for this paper, a lot of us were led to believe that transthoracic echo can be kind of useless for aortic dissection, but that's actually not the case. Actually, it's quite useful in the case that you see something abnormal, right? So you can visualize portions of the aorta at the initial, a decent transthoracic echo can visualize portions of the aorta, the aortic root itself, valvular regurgitation. They can give you clues to aortic dissection or the reason why your patient's decompensating. I think a special sort of plug for POCUS in this case is a patient who's hypotensive and you think might have an aortic dissection. Um, taking a look at the heart itself and seeing, hey, is there a huge pericardial effusion here? Can I throw some flow on this valve if I can see it? Does it look like there's a lot of regurge through this aortic valve? That can give you a lot of clues too. And that is an important part of workup for the individual emergency physician at bedside saying, why is this patient hypotensive? Or why is this person with dissection decompensating? So I think it can be useful in that case. Good. And then there's, of course, CT. So CT angiography being what we would consider now like a gold standard for the emergency yeah. department. But accuracy is very good. Yeah, um, like on the order of 98 to 100%, actually. The C the modern CTs have really supplanted the actual dye angiography, which used to be the gold standard for diagnosis of a acute aortic syndromes or acute aortic uh, dissection. And the great thing about CT is that you can depending on how advanced your scanners are, and most of them are pretty advanced, you know, you're able to image with subtraction of motion artifact, you can image penetrating aortic ulcers, you can Im image intramural hematoma. So you might pick something else up on a CT aortogram besides the dissection itself. And so they're very accurate. And this is contrast enhanced CT. So right. there was mention in the issue about non-contrast CT, but that's not really very helpful for this specific diagnosis. Is that right? Yeah, I think you could say that non-contrast CT is like a million chest x-rays. And in that, essentially, if you see something abnormal, there are two findings on non-contrast CT that are indicative of aortic dissection. And that would be essentially like a sort of semi-lunar area of calcification that appears separated from the wall of the aorta or intimal calcium that's been moved into the middle of the aorta. So if you see some of these patients who have calcified aortas and actually have torn through them, you'll see a double barrel aorta on non-contrast CT. But apart from those things, a non-contrast CT really can't tell you much, and its accuracy isn't really that great. So we don't uh, recommend it in the paper for primary diagnosis of aortic dissection. We recommend a CT, a contrasted CT aortogram. Now, we touched on this earlier, but there is growing evidence that renal function really doesn't matter when you're going to be giving IV contrast and when you're looking at something as acutely life-threatening as aortic dissection. Should that even be a consideration in what we're doing? I think there's a pretty good volume of evidence now, and even the American College of Radiology recommendations are getting stronger and stronger. seems like every day saying, hey, this really isn't... Uh, as big an issue as we once thought it was going to be. And if this is a life-threatening problem, it doesn't really matter what their renal function currently is. is that, does yeah. that work for yeah, you? Yeah, I think you encapsulated that 100%. Yeah, and I, and I think if you, even if you look at the American College of Radiology guidelines, it says, essentially, if a life-threatening diagnosis exists and missing that diagnosis is greater than the risk of renal fa failure with uh, contrast induced nephropathy, then you should image that patient. And I think in the, we could do a whole podcast on this, right, Sam, but I think in the, in the world of iso osmolar, uh, contrast now, we're not using high osmolar contrast. The risk of, uh, contrast induced nephropathy probably isn't really a thing anymore. And it's really probably more whatever predisposed you to go into the CAT scanner and get, uh, renal injury that was already pre-existing there. And so in this case, missing the diagnosis of aortic dissection is very dangerous. And I think we have a ton of good evidence, large retrospective studies, and lots of data that show that contrast-induced nephropathy is not really a thing here. Good. And then there was some discussion about MRI. 
So yeah. what exactly is the advantage to MRI or why would one consider MRI versus CT, for example? Yeah, I think for the emergency physician, this is probably something we would rarely, if ever, use, partially because aortic dissection itself is such an unstable disease. You don't want to send someone to the MRI scanner to lay there forever where they're going to be unmonitored or have difficulty with resuscitative uh, measures if needed. But the great thing about MRI for uh, aortic dissection is it can tell you a lot about the dissection itself. And based on what we sort of our research and reading, it seems that it may be more useful in operative planning for less emergent dissection. So for example, like a type B dissection that's on its way to becoming a type A or, you know, flow dynamics, they can look at which way the fluid is flowing in the aorta, you know, up the dissection, down the dissection. So it is extremely accurate, but it takes a long time to get the images. And like I said, there's a large risk of the patient decompensating. Good. Okay, so we've made the diagnosis now of aortic dissection, and we're doing something to temporize or stabilize or resuscitate the patient. Where are we starting? Let's assume the patient's hypertensive and not in the more rare hypotensive presentation. What's our first-line go-to therapy there? Right. So what we want to do is we really want to optimize what some would call the double part product or the heart rate times the blood pressure. And the reason is because simple physics, Laplace's law, right, the more pressure you put on the wall, the higher the tension is going to be in the wall and basically the higher risk of rupture or worsening dissection. And so the key is to optimize both the heart rate and the blood pressure. We want to optimize the heart rate first because we want to prevent some rebound tachycardia when we optimize the blood pressure. So a great agent would be something that comes on very quickly, but if we overcorrect, we want to be able to take it off very quickly. So a rapidly titratable beta blocker for heart rate and then for blood pressure, something that has a similar feature, right? So something that is rapidly titratable and it has a very predictable effect on blood pressure. So traditionally, the medications that were taught for heart rate would be beta-1 agents like esmolol, metoprolol, things like that, but something that would slow the heart rate down and then you can titrate it off and its half-life is somewhere in the order of, you know, five to eight minutes, basically. Good. And then we used to talk about nitroprusside for these emergent hypertensive scenarios, but there's a lot of negative side effects to medications like that. So there are some good alternatives nowadays. Right. And yeah, the nitroprusside thing, although still tested on in-service training and board exams and things like that, the reason that it's fallen out of favor is because of the cyanide toxicity over long term. But not so much because of that, but because of its in unpredictability in its effect on blood pressure. And so now with a lot of the newer calcium channel blockers, um, like nicardipine and clavidipine and things like that, those agents really are sort of titratable within a few minutes, and you can achieve pretty tight control that's very predictable. And, and a caveat as well is we don't want to use things like nitroglycerin or beta blockers or calcium channel blockers as much with mixed effects, right? So like diltiazem can be used, but can have effects on the heart rate too. So in combination with rate control medication that can cause, you know, unpredictable effects. So it's nice to be able to titrate both your heart rate and your blood pressure independently. And the goals for both of those parameters, what's recommended? Yeah, classically, so the heart rate is about 60 and the blood pressure somewhere around 100 to 120. Now those data actually come from the 60s. You may see that in the paper. It's kind of an interesting historical thing that back when operative intervention had a high mortality, some of these patients were served just as well to be managed medically. And so they were able to glean a lot of data looking at patients who were managed medically. And they found that patients who were managed medically basically did better when their heart rates were around 60 and their blood pressures around 100 to 120, although nobody's really investigated that really since then, but we know that's what decreases mortality. And then on the other side of the spectrum, if somebody presents in shock or severe hypotension, what kind of things are we looking at for medical management or stabilization in the ED? Sure. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, contained rupture of, or excuse me, rupture of the uh, aorta itself is fairly rare and extremely fatal. So most of the times the hypotension won't be from an aortic rupture. Now it may be from a contained rupture pressing on something and specifically dissection into the pericardium. And so that's what you should think. Should Is this a tamponade? So that's a great place for us to evaluate with point of care ultrasound. So that's really going to tell us kind of where we should go with this. So if we've got somebody who's got a rupture, then obviously initiating blood transfusion is key here. But that, again, like I said, is a very fatal event and most likely 
those patients don't make it to the hospital. So the most two most common things that patients have are either myocardial ischemia or, per, or cardiac tamponade. In the case of cardiac tamponade, giving small boluses of either blood or uh, IV fluid is always indicated in this case. And also there's something called contained uh, pericardial drainage, which we discussed in the paper as a temporizing treatment for patients who can't make it immediately to the operating room. And we can discuss that as well. All right. So tell me about that. So CPD or contained pericardial drainage is an interesting thing. There's actually some data from Japanese studies out there that show basically that insertion of like a, a pigtail catheter or even a central line wire or something like that with a three-way stopcock and then taking off 10 to 20 mLs of fluid from the pericardium can actually improve outcomes. Now, traditionally, people were taught that large volume pericardiocentesis in patients with aortic dissection caused mortality, but what several different groups have found is that small volume CPD, like I said, somewhere between 10, 10 mLs and 10, 20 mLs, actually improves mortality and allows people to get to the operating room sooner. Good. So something to keep in mind, even if you can get yeah. a little bit out of there, that might actually right. be life-sustaining until they get to the OR. Exactly. The, the real trouble comes in when you have somebody with coronary artery dissection into one of the coronary arteries, and that's causing myocardial ischemia. And that, that I'm sure we'll discuss it, but that can really, you don't have a lot of room to move there, and that can be difficult to treat as well. All right. And then when we talk about surgical management, so who is it nowadays that's actually going to the OR? Yeah. So most of your type A dissections, unless the patient, the family doesn't want to do it or the patient wants to be on palliative care or something like that, but most of your type A dissections will go to the operating room because at this point, the operative mortality is much lower than just medical management for these patients for a variety of reasons. Type B, traditionally, we had been sort of treating medically, meaning blood pressure control, heart rate control. But what they found was that over time that some of these patients actually progressed and needed operative intervention in the future. So the type B patients, actually, a lot of data is coming out that endovascular repair of those dissections actually prevents long-term mortality. So those patients may go to the ICU on a drip and then go for an urgent repair using endovascular techniques. And as a caveat, the Type A PAUs and intramural hematomas, we treat those like aortic dissections because they have a high rate of conversion to aortic dissection. So anything type A really warrants emergent cardiovascular surgery consultation. Type B penetrating aortic ulcers and intramural hematomas, some of them benefit from operative intervention, some of them benefit from watching, but they all need surgical consultation to make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that hit everything on my list. So anything else you want to mention at the end? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. I, I want, actually, one thing we should talk about is the sort of malperfusion syndrome thing. Okay. Uh, so that's a sort of a difficult topic because if you have a patient, let's say you have a patient who has the STEMI, the low percentage of patients that have a ST elevation MI and an aortic dissection, what do you do? Right? So that was something we came across. And actually, a lot of the data that came out is initially people were treating the aortic dissection first, and then they would go after the malperfusion syndrome. So whatever the malperfusion syndrome may be, it may be a, a right ventricular MI, it might be intestinal ischemia, it might be severe acute renal failure. But what they found was that actually if you reperfuse the patient first, so for example, go in with an endovascular approach if it's in the thoracic aorta and you fenestrate or put a stent in, allow that vessel, allow that organ to maintain perfusion, and then you take them to the operating room, those patients actually had a significantly lower mortality because patients with malperfusion syndromes, they actually they actually die from the organ failure, not the dissection more often. And so that's what I think it, there's a large study out there that showed that um, it's like six or seven times the mortality if you have a malperf malperfusion syndrome that isn't addressed before you go to the operating room for the dissection itself. Wow. And the same goes for, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And the same goes for concomitant MI. The reason being that specifically left ventricular MI, if you don't address that first, so if you don't take that patient to the cath lab, put a stent in, and then take them to the OR, so this requires a multidisciplinary team. Another reason for a specialty center, right? So you have people who are sort of familiar with the data and, and up to date on that and working together. If you don't fix the cardiac problem, they will have a lot of difficulty weaning them off bypass. So even if the uh, aortic dissection repair is successful, it can result in the same morbidity and bad outcome in the end. Wow. 
So then that requires endovascular treatment of the STEMI through an aorta that's dissecting right. while your surgeons right. are standing by waiting to take this patient then on to the next step. Yeah, exactly. And and so that's why I think, like we said before, it, having a special a specialty center that you can reach out to that you, you know, can stay in touch with. And, and I think that neither of us are surgeons, but I think that it would require the, the presence of a hybrid OR where you have vascular and interventional cardiology at bedside and they're used to working with each other. And, but I think intuitively, a lot of us, that's, that's kind of like, well, what do you do with this patient? Mm-hmm. But the data bears out that addressing the malperfusion syndrome is beneficial. Good. And as we've mentioned lots of times on this podcast, this is just one more reason to have those transfer agreements and those specialty services accessible at your nearby hospital all set up in advance. So you're not trying to sort this out at the moment you're trying to then stabilize this patient, but there's already a set protocol for where this kind of person goes. As rare as it may be, you don't want to be making that decision while standing at the bedside. Exactly. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Before we end the podcast, I do want to mention that you yourself have your own podcast. Now tell me the name again. It's called, Is That a Thing? Is that podcast. a thing? Yeah. And it's it's medical? It's medical, yeah. Yeah, we look at all the sort of dogma in emergency medicine and critical care. Um, it's things that you walk into your ro- a room and you're doing it and you kind of think, why do we do that? So, uh, for example, contrast nephropathy or treatment of you know intermediate risk pulmonary embolism, things that you think about and you're like, man, I should look that up. And when you do look it up, you realize, man, there's a lot of controversy over this. So that's kind of what we address wow. and it's a monthly podcast. Fantastic. And that's you and who else? Dr. Uh, Hugh Hiller, who's at University of North Carolina. Fantastic. So we talk about controversies and and cutting edge in every issue of both emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice. And so this is just one more opportunity to listen to those kinds of topics. Is that a thing available in the Apple, Google, and Spotify podcast areas? Yeah, thanks so much. I awesome. appreciate it, Sam. Well, thank cool. you again for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to both author the article and to be with us on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap for this month's episode of Amplify. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to Dr. Hackett once again for co-authoring the article in Emergency Medicine Practice and for being a guest on the podcast. Again, I want to remind you that there is the $50 Amazon gift card offer at ebmedicine.net. And I want to encourage you to go to the website, click on the blog, share your feedback, peruse the free content, the clinical pathways, the special articles, the risk management information. It is just a wealth of resources there for you for free. And I hope you have a wonderful, peaceful, safe holiday season. And from both me and the entire staff at EB Medicine, we wish you the happiest of holidays. We will see you in January. Bye-bye, everyone.